So this is episode 31 in a series called uh, Spiritual Lessons from World War I. And we are in 1916, the summer months uh, of 1916. The war is going to start basically August, uh, early August. August 4th is going to be a key day in the war, but things start before that. There's going to be a gunshot that goes off, and the Archduke Franz Ferdinand is going to fall uh, July or June 28th of 1914. And then a month later, Austria-Hungary is going to declare war on Serbia as, you know, who, how could they get away with this uh, criminal act? And then Russia is going to mobilize. When Russia mobilizes, Germany is going to then declare war on Russia and, strangely, France. It's like, what does France have to do with this? But Germany feels encircled, so if they're going to defend Austria-Hungary against Russia, they need to strike France first because France and Russia are allies. So this convoluted nonsense that we know as World War I is going to begin because of a foolish thing in the Balkans, a gunshot to kill an heir apparent to the throne of Austria-Hungary is literally going to lead to tens of millions of deaths. And it's also going to change the course of history. The world in which we live is directly defined by this uh, four-year period of time known as World War I. And so there's a lot to that. There's a lot of uh, moments that we've already covered. I mean, if you're in the 31st episode, there's a lot of water under the bridge already. This particular message has been a harder one for me, and I'm trying, I've been trying to pin down why. It's one of the most well-known events in World War I, and maybe that's why. Uh, you know, maybe it's like I feel a little pressure, because I sort of like going off the beaten path to talk about obscure moments. I don't really like talking about the moments everyone else talks about, and yet it's sort of hard to ignore, uh, and that is the Battle of the Somme. And to the British, this is one of the most agonizing memories of their entire illustrious history, is this battle. It is going to be a multi-month battle, but I'm going to be talking basically about the first day, because the first day is the one that contains the lessons in it, and that's what I'm always looking for. In other words, I'm not just looking for some bloodshed, I'm looking for the lessons that we can grab a hold of and can impact our life. And there is a good one in this, even though I have to admit it's a harder one to know how to stage because I'm dealing with a very real historic event and I'm dealing with a very real spiritual truth and sometimes you know, the synopsis go and this one I, I can see it, but setting it up will be interesting. So we'll see how well Eric does in this. Uh, I've changed the name for this one a lot of times uh, and I like this title now, uh, so I'm sticking with it, The First Wave. And in the Psalm uh, Offensive, is what it's called to the British, the Psalm Offensive, this is an offensive maneuver. You see, we have a stalemate along the Western Front, which I'll go into in just a second. Joseph Stalin is going to uh, be famous for this quote. Some people say he never even said it, but isn't that the way history works? It's sort of like famous quotes sometimes were never said. So it's like, well, who did say it then? We don't know. But a single death is a tragedy, a million deaths a statistic. And there's a lot of eerie truth packaged into that statement that if you find out about one person's death, it's a very significant thing and you feel the weight of it. But when you hear that a million people died, you don't have a grid for it. And so it just becomes a big number. And you lose the faces, you lose the personalities, you, lo you lose the value of the individual life, and you end up in just like an it's-so-sad state. But you don't have a grievance over an individual loss. It's, it's a very fascinating uh, concept, and that's what begins to happen in World War I. And in this battle, you're going to have such devastation and you're going to see one of the biggest mistakes of the leadership and of the generalship of the, of the British is that they're not going to show a proper remorse for what they're going to do because it's in a sense, it's like, hey, this is just war. This is just what happens. And yet there's going to be a backlash from society because of that. It's like, how dare you take these lives so lightly? So here's our map that we've been looking at throughout the series. Uh, the, the middle uh, countries, the reddish, purplish color, uh, probably would be best to just call it like maroon, but I'm not exactly sure what color that is. But uh, we have Germany at the top. It looks like a horse's head. Then we have Austria-Hungary. 
I should probably describe what, uh, what shape that is, but I'm not sure what to describe the Austria-Hungary shape. But it's a lot bigger than most people would ever think because most people didn't, most of us in here did not grow up in a time period in which uh, Austria-Hungary existed, right? Should I, should I just say none of us grew up in a time period in which Austria-Hungary existed? And then there's Italy at the bottom. And uh, World War I is going to be noted for the fact that Germany and Austria-Hungary will be allies, but Italy is not going to participate with them because they have a treaty that says that if Austria-Hungary and Germany are attacked, then they will defend. But Austria-Hungary and Germany are going to be the uh, offensive characters, the aggressors in this, and so Italy will bow out, and Russia, France, and United Kingdom will be what are typically called the Triple Entente, at least at the beginning of the war, and then they're going to transfer into the term the Allies. Uh, and so if you, I, I'm going to put a picture of the Western Front. It's not as straight-lined as that, but you're going to see this is where the stalemate is taking place. It's just right at the edge of Belgium, down through France to the edge of Switzerland, right along the border of Germany. This is going to be the formation of the stalemate, and for four years, men will be killed along this line. And there will be great maneuvers, great offensives that will try and take territory, and they might take a mile, and then the next battle, they lose the mile. And meanwhile, that cost both countries a million men. And so this is such a disaster and a, a terrible situation. But the, both sides are trying over and over again to solve this dilemma. How do you break through this? How do we get this war over with? We need to do something. And so the Psalm Offensive is going to hit right here. And it's actually where the, the British forces to the north, up near Belgium area, and the French forces are going to connect. And there's a river called the Somme there. And that is actually where the battle is going to take place. Unpacking the tragedy of the Somme. 60,000 casualties in mere minutes. That's just setting the stage. Douglas Haig uh, is the new British field marshal. So we had a guy named John French. Now, some of you weren't here uh, at Ellerslie during the time when we were talking about John French, but he was sort of the commander-in-chief of the military. And what's funny is he's the British commander-in-chief and his last name is French and he doesn't like the French. You know, it's just one of those ironies. But uh, finally, he's going to be sacked. He's going to be uh, fired. And you, know, you can say for good reason. In fact, most people would say, why wasn't he fired a lot earlier? Because some of the things he did were just uh, terrible. This guy's going to come in. And I, my subtitle underneath is the new British field marshal <clears throat> um, with the same ideas. In other words, he's going to do the same thing. The way that they've described it in history is there's a brick wall, and the generals for the British keep banging their head against it, thinking that maybe it'll eventually break. And that is precisely what this feels like. And Douglas Haig is going to go down in history known as uh, the Butcher. Uh, so if that gives you any idea of how favorable uh, his reputation is in Great Britain. But here's a picture of the poor guy who's going to go down in history as the Butcher. But there's a lot of pride in the generalship. And, and that's not just of, uh, of England, that's of any country. There's just a desire to appear bigger than life. In fact, a lot of these men, after the war, will write memoirs to, def to defend everything that is their decision, what they did, to try and give the most positive light on their decisions. And most of the public doesn't even believe it. So if a general is writing a book, no one believes it. It's like, oh yeah, yeah, uh, they're just trying to defend themselves. So this is Barbara Tuckman in the Guns of August, and she's going to give a summary of this four-year stalemate. After it, with the adv advent of winter, came a slow, steadily sinking into the stalemate of trench warfare, running from Switzerland to the Channel like a gangrenous wound across, France, uh, across French and Belgian territory. The trenches determined the war of position and attrition, the brutal, mud-filled, murderous insanity known as the Western Front that was to last for four more years. So there's a character that I've introduced in the past, fascinating character. His name is Lord Horatio Kitchener. And I'm going to call him the robust picture of British patriotism. So I have a picture of him here. He's actually the guy that's going to be on all the posters. Now, in America, we're going to get this idea of Uncle Sam, and we're going to have a We Want You poster that starts coming out. Well, where do you think it was modeled from? It was actually modeled off of this one, which came from Great Britain in World War I, and the guy on it is Lord Horatio Kitchener. 
So he's a war hero. He's over, he's like the secretary of war uh, or the minister of war for Great Britain during this time. And he's beloved by the country. And he's not the one on the ground, boots on the ground, the general over the military operations, but he's over the overarching uh, thing. And the first thing he's going to do is he's going to begin to recruit. At the time uh, that this starts, everyone believes that World War I is going to last two to three months. No one expects it to last longer, except for this guy. This guy knows that this is going to be multiple years, three to four years, and it's going to cost millions of lives. So he begins recruiting, and he is going to build an army of zealous patriots, and they're young men, and the, the premier young men of the country, and he is going to reserve them. And the generals keep asking for them, like, let us have them. We want to spend them, and we need them here. And Lord Horatio Kitchener will not let them touch him because he wants to spend them for something that is truly going to make a difference because he sees all these wasted lives and he wants these men to be used for something truly the nation can be proud of. Last thing he wants to do is waste these men on one of these pointless battles. So it's called in history Kitchener's Army and they were preserved for something truly patriotic. Now this isn't a direct quote, this is an indirect quote. This is like a paraphrase of a concept. Don't waste these young men's patriotic fervor. Use them where they can truly make a difference. And so I have a picture, a different picture of Horatio Kitchener in 1914, so that's what he looked like. So you can get the idea, he's sort of the, he's like a Santa Claus-ish uh, character, uh, very interesting. And he, but the fact that he wanted to protect these lives, you, you need to realize that was going over well. Public opinion polls were high and they liked this guy. The nation liked this guy. All the moms liked this guy, you know, who's like, we don't want to waste our sons because it felt like in contrast, the generals were like, hey, let's waste your sons. That's at least how it was translated, even though I know that that's not what their position was. That's what it felt like. And so Lord Horatio Kitchener is protecting them. So the strange and unexpected death of Lord Horatio Kitchener. Hmm. This is uh, considered one of the great uh, conspiracy theories of all time, okay? So if you want to study a, a conspiracy theory, this would be a good one for you. He's on a ship in the North Sea headed to Russia for some diplomatic reasons, and supposedly there was a nine-force gale wind that comes up and uh, uh, maybe a missile that hits, you know, a torpedo that hits the boat and they're sinking. He's standing on the mast of the, you know, the mast of the ship. He's standing on the, uh, what do you call it? The, the what? The bow of the ship. And, you know, without blanching at all, he just sinks under the water. And someone witnessed this, right? And, you know, it's the famous death of Lord Horatio Kitchener. However, this was the one guy that was preserving all of this military strength. And then three weeks later, all of Kitchener's army is going to re be recruited to the Psalm. And they're going to be spent in the Psalm. And so all that Kitchener had been protecting, strangely, was now unprotected and immediately requisitioned and used, which is where the conspiracies come from. It's like the generals, of course, wanted these men. They couldn't get these men. These are some of the best fighting men. And then Lord Horatio Kitchener strangely dies in the North Seas. Hmm. And so I, I'm not weighing in on it. I'm just saying that's good uh, conspiracy fodder right there. The Battle of the Somme, the obvious preparation, the guaranteed victory. So just to give you some context, the Battle of Verdun, which we have just covered, has nearly broken France which was the whole goal by the Germans, was to break France in and through a war of attrition, which means the, uh, the spending of lives. And so France has lost a good deal of its military strength in Verdun to maintain Verdun. And so Ver uh, France is begging the Great Britain to do something to help them, to create a distraction for the Germans, like a hit somewhere, an offensive somewhere, which will force the Germans to take men from Verdun somewhere else because they can't hold this line much longer. And so the Somme is being built, and meanwhile the, the British are bringing in all of these uh, artillery uh, devices, all of these men, they're doing all sorts of training, and everyone knows in the world what is happening. This is not a secret offensive. The Germans on the other side, they, they're gonna pick the one spot in all of the German line 
which is the most heavily fortified. And so you could look at this in so many regards and say, this is a really bad idea. This, there is no secret to it. The Germans know you're going to hit. And you're picking the worst spot along this entire line to hit, where they are, they are strongest. And if you try and get into the logic of this, it's hard, okay? And especially not being military thinkers, as you know, maybe some of you are. But it's hard, even with the highest level military thinkers of the day, there was debate on this. And so I don't think it helps for us to weigh in on that, other than just to say it's debatable if this was a good idea to start with. But to make it clear what your plan is, is usually in war not the best idea, because surprise is one of the greatest strengths that you can have. But this was a guaranteed victory, okay? The British are just like, if we spend it this way, if we hit them this way with the French, we're going to break them here at the Somme. And everyone is so excited because we can finally break through this stalemate. And so this is the guarantee. And what they're going to do, see, they have a problem, and that is that they need to attack these fortifications, but they need all of the obstructions removed. And in World War I, we have the advent, or the, the invention is an incorrect statement, but the advent of the use of barbed wire. So you have this barbed wire barrier that stands between you and the enemy trenches. And so if you were, say, say we were a group of uh, military scientists and we are tasked with the business of figuring out a way to decimate barbed wire so that a million troops can run through no man's land and take the trenches of the Germans. So they've come up with their solution. I don't know what your solution would be, but they've come up with their solution. And their solution is, well, let's see. I, I probably should do this first. I'll, I'll just, before, I'm going to hold that back. See, don't you like how I did that storytelling-wise? I baited you, and then I held it back. So let me just describe the German defenses at the Somme. First of all, this is Winston Churchill's statement about them. Undoubtedly the strongest, most perfectly defended position in the world, and that's where Douglas Haig decides to attack. I mean, that's an odd one. And Winston Churchill in history is known for his criticism of Douglas Haig's attack at the Somme. Okay, now some people were supportive of it. They, they were Haigites, and um, Churchill was not. So you can sort of see my leaning because I have a tendency to lean in the direction of Churchill. I mean, it's because my middle name is Winston. You guys do know that, right? And so this is the German defenses. They're 30 to 40 feet underground. They have electric lights, wallpaper, ventilation, and they're lined with wood boards. They're like, they're decked out here. There, it's, this is the territory, if you remember uh, a previous message where I talked about the chalk mines and the tunnels underground, I think it was called the Dra Dragonhull, uh, and there's all these chalk mines out there, so you could literally dig down and then you create this reinforcement so you can take artillery bombardment and really it doesn't bother you. And that's where they're at. And so the secret for uh, Great Britain is they have a plan to get through this barbed wire. So the big obstacle at the Somme is the barbed wire. The solution for the barbed wire, that's easy. Three million artillery shells in one week. So I think up to this time, this is the biggest artillery bombardment in history, okay? Which, I mean, a bombardment back in the days of like, I think it was Waterloo and Napoleon was 20,000 cannonballs, which would have been astounding, 20,000. This is three million in seven days that are gonna hit this territory. I mean, that is beyond what most people can even compute in their brain what that's going to be like, where you cannot hear the distinguishing sound of any one uh, blast because they're all happening just constantly for seven days. And what the British mind is on this is that that will devastate all the barbed wire. So in seven days, everything should be cleared. In fact, most of the Germans should be dead. And now we can rush in with our hundreds of thousands of men and take this territory rather easily. It's a great idea, right? If your presumption is true, and that is that artillery fire will destroy barbed wire, when in fact it doesn't. Isn't that just a weird thought that these bomb blasts do not actually touch barbed wire? <laughs> I mean, that's just... Well, that's, that's going to be just as shocking to them because they have built their entire plan around it. 
So I'm giving a general quote of the British generals. The barbed wire will explode into pieces. That's what they know is going to happen. So testing the theory with Kitchener's army. So guess who's right at the front here? Kitchener's army. And they're going to be the ones to test, the, test this theory of artillery shells for one week. Three million of them are bound to destroy all this barbed wire. This is July 1st, 1916. So they're going over the top. They're all in the trenches, and now it's time. And it's going to be wave one. So when I call this the first wave, that has meaning in this message. Because what we have is a situation that is going to not go well. I think you guys are starting to pick up on that, that this is not a good situation for the British. And yet they don't know that up to this point. Up to this point, they've endured seven days of three million shells. And now it's time to take advantage of what that has accomplished. So it's called going over the top when you come out of your trench and you run towards no man's land, which is the territory between you and the enemy's trench. And there's usually barbed wire in between. So the British have removed their own barbed wire. And now they're presuming that the Germans' barbed wire is gone. <clears throat> so the British generals, here's another general quote. Uh, the way is now cleared. We're going over the top and we're going to devastate the Germans. Everyone is in a good mood, right? This is a big moment. So the first wave of patriotic fervor and their last letters home. So this is one of those rare insights because a lot of these men are going to die. And you don't always get to hear what they thought in these moments. We just sort of like try and put ourselves in it. And you're like, what would that be like? And this is not the easiest letter to read, I have to admit. But it is very... Uh, it's meaningful to me. Like when I read it as a man, it, is, it's, it stirs me and it touches me at a very deep level. But this is one of the men that is going over the top here. His name is, he's a captain. His name is Charles May. And so this is basically the day uh, that the men are uh, going to go over the top. And he says this, he writes home to his wife, I must not allow myself to dwell on the personal. There's no room for it here. Also, it is demoralizing but I do not want to die. Not that I mind for myself. If it be that I am to go, I am ready. But the thought that I may never see you or our darling baby again turns my bowels to water. I cannot think of it with even a semblance of equanimity. My one consolation is the happiness that has been ours. Also, my conscience is clear that I've always tried to make life a joy for you. I know at least that if I go, you will not want. That is something. But it is the thought that we would be cut cut off from one another, which is so terrible, and that our babe may grow without knowing her, and her, without, knowing, without my knowing her and her knowing me. It's difficult to face, and I know your life without me would be a dull blank, yet you, would never let it become, yet you must never let it become wholly so, for to you will be left the greatest charge in all the world, the upbringing of our baby. God bless that child. She is the hope of life to me. Goodbye, my darling. It may be you will only have to read these lines as ones of passing interest. On the other hand, they well may be my last message to you. If they are, know through all your life that I have loved you and baby with all my heart and soul, and that you two sweet things just were all the world to me. I pray God that I may do my duty, for I know that whatever that would entail, you would not have it otherwise. And Captain Charles May died the next day. Those are weighty things because a lot of times when you look at the death of one life is a tragedy. When it's a million, eh, we just start to blur over. But when you can see Charles May in it, it has a greater impact on us. Because when you just hear of Kitchener's army and this one group of patriotic British that were saved for the key moment that would press us through, you begin to feel the waste of it but you don't feel the personal touch of it, the Charles May impact on our life. And something in our life as well is, is critical with that. When you hear that 150,000 people are dying and going to hell today, which is statistically a round number, right? It's not uh, going to be exactly 150,000. It was like 149,999. Oh, there's going to be one more that, oh, there they go. It, it doesn't work that way. However, statistically, it's somewhere in that range 
of people that will die today that do not know Jesus. That's a serious thing. And if you could reach in and do something in this situation to change the outcome for Charles May, you probably would want to do it because you care about him even though you hardly know him. But you feel that he's human like you are. He may not be a believer, but you feel his humanity and you feel the value of his life. You sense the importance of it, that it's not to be wasted. 60,000 are lost in minutes. So it's not just that 60,000 are lost in the first day, which would be an accurate statement, but these 60,000 are going to die in the very beginning movements of this conflict. And the reason is, the first wave is going to come out and go over the top, and they're going to run towards the enemy's camp. Now, the enemy is expecting them. Once the artillery shell fire finishes, you have to recognize the Germans know exactly where they're going to attack. Why? Because they've been hitting it for seven days. So they know where they're coming. So they are all lined up and in a position with their machine guns aimed straight at the incoming horde. Now, this is a lot of men, and it's hard to take out all those men with, with machine gun fire, which means some of them are going to get through unless the barbed wire is still up. And the barbed wire is still up. So these hordes of British are going to run out, and they can't get through. And then there's more coming in behind them, and they can't get through. So there might be a little gap, so they're starting to form lines to get through the little gap. Meanwhile, they're being mowed down. They have, they are there sitting ducks in the middle of no man's land, and all the Germans are waiting for them. And in mere minutes, the biggest loss in any day of any war uh, the British have ever been in is going to happen right here in minutes. They're going to lose 60,000 men. Now, here's the interesting thing, and the reason I'm, I'm emphasizing this, and sorry to do that, because usually I don't talk about death in, in the battle. That isn't what I've emphasized for 30 messages before this. However, there is a moment in this where a decision could be made. The first wave goes out, and the officers can see what is taking place. They can't get through. And yet, the command is to keep sending them and to keep a constant fluid movement. And what has been, when, what has been difficult for the British throughout history, and even the men that were there, the few that survived, because if any survived, they were standing there saying, someone's head is, has to roll for this. I mean, as they're standing there just being shot down and all their friends are, are falling down next to them. And yet very few are going to come out and be able to express their opinion of what this was. But when the first wave goes, there is an opportunity to halt the second. But they continue and they send another wave. And then they send another wave. And then they send another wave. And... The foolishness of this, I think all of us in here can measure, and we're like, that doesn't sound wise. Why would you do that if you recognize that continued forward movement would lead to disaster? Now, I could circle that exact thought in your head, and I could say, that's a good one. Now, let's remember that thought. If you knew that forward movement from this exact point in your life would lead to greater harm in your life, then why would you continue? Such is the propulsion of sin, right there. And so what I just defined, even though we can look at the Battle of the Psalm and the proud generals who refused to acknowledge that anything was off, this is what they had invested the last year in, was this day. And so to call it off would be tantamount to acknowledging that they were wrong. And so they can't do that, so they are going to continue to spend lives and after they spend 60,000 men in that first day, they will never acknowledge that it was a mistake. And this principle here, that, that kernel uh, of arrogance in the generals of the British uh, military system, is something that we do not like. And we can stare at, even though we're not British, or well, at least most of us probably are not British, and we can say, that is, that's wrong. But it's the propensity of every military general. And get this, it's the propensity of every individual Christian. You see, we have a similar propensity where there's a first wave of movement in our life 
to draw us into a conflict. Now, I'm going to walk through this, and I just want to see if I can put that together, that puzzle piece for you together, so you can see and match your disdain for how the British soldiers, Kitchener's army, is going to be handled, how Captain Charles May is going to be treated in this situation, because he's going to go down in this situation. And you care about Charles May. And how that links with your spiritual life. So lessons from the first wave. Now, I usually don't use the term first wave when I speak of this particular principle, but it's a principle of beginnings. There is a momentum that is created in your life from a propulsion of sin, enticement, temptation. You could, there's a lot of different words we could give for it. It's a wooing, it's a drawing towards something that is harmful in your life. Now, it's hard to think that any of you in here have not ever experienced whatever that draw is, that pull. It is a very real thing upon the human uh, life, the human soul, the human psyche. We are vulnerable to it. And so there are certain behaviors like in my life where I recognize that when I have them, it's a signal that I've begun to move in the wrong direction. Okay, now, most of us would say, yeah, if, if you were murdering someone, yeah, you probably have moved in the wrong direction. However, most of us, it's not that we're murdering someone, it's that we are experiencing a smaller version of failure, and that's a signal to our soul that we need to change direction. And so I will call these first things. That's the term that I've used for them, first things. And there are first things in my life that are dead giveaways that Eric needs to acknowledge that I'm headed in the wrong direction and I need to turn. And a lot of times, like for instance, if I begin to put emphasis on something other than my relationship with Christ, okay, there's so many things in this earth that you know, need attention. And yet if I become thin in my walk, I become vulnerable to certain things. Like my first things, and I don't know what yours are, are irritation and frustration. And so I find myself extra irritable. When I am extra irritable, that's like the first wave going over the top and running into barbed wire. It's like, oh, this should signal to me that something needs to change in the battle plan. If I continue in this direction, greater hazards are ahead. If I keep sending out my men and just saying, hey, I'm fine, then what I'm doing is I'm setting myself up for a battle of the psalm, and we don't want that. You see, you, you end up spending very, a precious dimension of your life, and then you try and justify. It's like, look, I'm fine. I didn't do anything wrong, when in actuality, you did. Your plan was incorrect. And so when in my life I begin to sense irritation and frustration, that's my signal to come before the Holy Spirit and say, God, is there a door that I've left open, a window that I've left open in my life that is letting in a draft from the outer realm of life, that, that zone out there where the enemy wants to bring in his air into my life, his impact into my life, his chill into my nice temperate environment. And when that takes place, that becomes an evaluation which can rectify and call off the second wave. Because the first wave, you know, you can understand in war that a first wave is going to be sent, hey, that was, we were incorrect, our calculations were off, pull them back. And that's still sad. There's no doubt about it. The fact that you lost 5,000 men in those first few minutes is not a good thought. And that is something to be regretted. However, do not continue to justify where you're going. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation is overtaking you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. Now the word temptation to us is a very lurid word, and it sometimes lacks the full breadth of what it means in Scripture to us which is not just a bait towards sensuality, which is the way most of us would look at a temptation, but it's also a trial. It's a testing of our life, our soul. 
And in each situation, there is no trial, no temptation, no bait in our life, no challenge that we could ever face that is not just common. This is like the, the stuff that all of us are going to, uh, to deal with. But we need to know that God is faithful and that he will not allow us to be tempted, to be tested, to be tried beyond what we are able, which means his grace is going to be sufficient to match whatever situation we're in. And so if you're one of the generals, now I, I've tried to put myself in, in general Heg's position or one of the officers, whoever's on the ground making the decision in this situation. And I've tried to put myself in that position and I recognize it would be very, very hard to call this off and to acknowledge mistake. There's gonna be multiple situations in World War I that are very similar to this, not always British. One of the next ones is French. And the French are going to attack and they are guaranteed, I mean, Nivelle Offensive, he's guaranteeing that this is going to work. And, uh, you know, as, as some people have said, and all, everyone else seemed to drink the Kool-Aid, and they all have believed in it, this is the final solution. And he's guaranteed, one of his big things is like, and I will call it off, if it hasn't worked, I think it was three days, I'll call it off after three days. Which is like a big deal, because generals seem to never call things off. So is this guy's even gonna call it off? Well, guess what, when he gets to those three days, what does he end up doing? Well, he has a justification why he needs to continue. Because a general can never acknowledge that he's wrong. It seems to be a principle of generalship. And yet, for our life, we need to have the exact opposite bent, that we are quick to acknowledge wrong. It's interesting how beneficial being quick to acknowledge wrong can be in your life. God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted, tried, challenged beyond what you are able but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. It's just an interesting phrase that a lot of people have taken in weird directions. Some people would, will say, oh, so I can get myself into a compromising situation, and if God doesn't want me to participate in it, he will make a way of escape for me. It's like, oh, no, 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 that, that's a very unwise way to live your life. It just means that you are going to face challenges and trials and temptations, and when you do, there is no trial, temptation, challenge that is going to come your way that is greater than what God has equipped you for, which means there is an answer, there is wisdom, there is supply for every trial you go through, which is very heartening and encouraging to know that God is faithful is applied to this situation. He can come through for you. He will come through for you if you trust him in this situation. However, most of us tend to be headstrong in these situations, and we tend to, like Douglas Haig, keep calling for the next wave. And we get into a momentum of sin, and that's what does us in. But there is a point in every movement forward, which I would say is a first wave issue, where you see your men coming up against that barbed wire, and you recognize that your theories were wrong. You recognize that there is an incorrect inside of you and you acknowledge it. And if in that moment you humble yourself, you save the day. Everything changes in the direction and the course of your inner man. But if you justify yourself, if your pride just continues to propel you, well then that can lead to disaster as we see in the Battle of the Psalm. Grabbing the banister. Now, I, I don't know if I've said this this semester. I know some of you in here have heard me mention grabbing the banister. It's a, it's a critical moment in my life that defines something. And that is, so we wind my life, uh, and I have this moment where something is baiting me or tempting me, you know, uh, wooing me into the lower regions of the house. It's in the middle of the night. And I get up and I start moving towards it. Now, I don't want to move towards it. I don't want to go in this direction. I'm sick and tired of going in this direction. I don't want to do this anymore in my life. You ever had that moment? And yet once the momentum starts, you just sort of keep moving. And even though you're like, I shouldn't go in this direction, I shouldn't go in this direction, there you are. You're going in that direction. And this is what I'm calling the first wave, okay? It's what the enemy has conned us into thinking is that once 
We send out that first wave, and they run into the barbed wire. You have to send out the second wave. Yeah, and you have to send out the third wave. And yeah, you have to send out the fourth wave. It's just a matter of course. This is just how things work. Don't believe it for a second. God always supplies a means of escape. However, most of us don't use it. There is an escape hatch known as humility at every juncture in this. When you begin to move in this direction and you're being awakened to a temptation, in that moment, in that first wave, what, what happened to me is I, I'm walking down the hall upstairs and there's something. I don't remember what it was, which I praise God that I don't remember what it was. But there I was at the top of the stairs and I didn't want to go down. I grabbed the banister. I grabbed the banister and I declared... To God, God, I do not want to go in that direction. I know you have given me something. I don't know what it is. I didn't know about the term grace. I didn't understand how all of this worked. I just knew he had to have something for me. If he's going to call me to live a life that is elevated, well, there has to be some solution for this. And so I grabbed the banister and I did not let go. And I said, God, I will not let go of this banister until I figure out what this is. I don't know how long the passage of time was, but it's probably about an hour that I was standing there at the top of the stairs grabbing a banister. And then I ended up going back to bed. And you could say, well, that's an exciting story, Eric. Thank you for sharing it. However, it was the first time in my life I ever realized that there was a way of escape. Before that, I had always continued forward. And I'd always regretted it and always been like, oh. And I'd lost 60,000 at the psalm. Ludie, what are you thinking? What are you doing? Okay, I know you guys have had this one like, discussion with your own soul at times, and you know that propulsion. However, do you know the intervention? Do you know the way of escape? Do you know the grace? That in that first wave, that first wave is alerting your soul that something is off, that you are headed in the wrong direction. So what do you do? You call off the second wave. All right, you don't keep going. You all know that in hearing the battle of the psalm. It's like, what idiots? Uh-huh. And the same is true for us. When the first wave has been proven faulty, you're headed in the wrong direction. This is a mistake. This leads to disaster. This is when you grab a hold of the banister. And you say, Lord, I need something beyond me. And those generals, you know, because I've, I've tried to think it through what it would have sounded like if they had halted it right then. Imagine how that goes back to Great Britain. It's just like, yeah, uh, we sent out our first wave of men after spending three million artillery shells an entire week. You know how expensive this has been? The amount of money, I mean, we're talking like a billion dollars, you know, in modern money to get this to this point. And you're going to send out a first wave, and in a matter of five minutes, we're going to be like, yeah, we're calling this one off. Can you understand how that momentum, it's like getting to the wedding day and say, you know what, I really feel like I'm not supposed to marry you. You, you sometimes end up saying, I do, just because you don't feel like you can say, I don't, I can't. And that is an unhealthy reasoning, but it does make sense on the human side, and so does the propulsion of sin. We are actually familiar, more familiar with the propulsion of sin into wave two, wave three, and wave four instead of grabbing hold of the banister and interrupting that and saying, God, I know this goes against the grain of my normal behavior, but I need you to intervene and stop this battle right now. I am going to lose this battle if this continues. Right now, I'm acknowledging even getting out of bed, and even putting my feet on the floor, and even walking these 20 steps was wrong. But Lord, intervene right now. I ask that you would give me grace, a grace from another realm, something that would enable me to change my direction. And when Eric went back to bed that night, what did I learn? I learned about something known as grace, even though I didn't yet have the term. I recognize that God does give something for that challenge, for that moment, for that first wave lesson. When you are awakened in the first wave, don't take it lightly. When the Spirit of God shows you the barbed wire and says, how you doing there, Ludi? <laughs> you don't laugh at the barbed wire and say, hey, that won't stop me. Learn your lesson in wave one. First things. 
So I don't know what your first things would be. And because again, when, when you've only lived one life in one body, you can be familiar with your things, but you can't always suppose that you know that everyone else's or that you, you, everyone else would be like you. And that's an important human truth. All of us have the same common ailment known as sin, but all of us are wired slightly different. You know, like I was telling someone the other night or telling someone the other day that one of my great baits in my life that distracts me mentally is puzzles. So I stay away from puzzles. And, but I can't say that puzzles are wrong for all of you. Puzzles are bad. Why? Why, why Eric, are puzzles bad? Because they're bad for me. So they must be bad for you. In other words, that's an incorrect assessment, right? They could be bad for you, but they could also be totally neutral and harmless to you. And they could be a wonderful way to spend time with your brothers and sisters and parents, right? And so for me, I recognize that irritation and frustration is my dead giveaway that I have left a window open and I have a draft in my house. I've left a door open. Something's off and I need to tend to it. And so just like in the winter, when you feel a draft and you follow it to the window, what should you do? You slam the window shut and that solves the draft. That's a first wave solution. Just close the crazy window. Don't wait till there's a snow drift on your couch before you go, you know what, maybe I should close the door. You deal with it when you see it. The measurement of humility. So when I was in missionary school, one of the teachers came in and he made a statement. And this statement has stood with me all these years. And that is, he said, did you guys know that you could measure humility? And I thought that was interesting, measure humility. How would you do that? So listen, this is good, guys. From the moment you realize that you're wrong, start the clock. And the measurement from that point is your measurement of humility. The moment you see that you're wrong, you immediately correct it. I acknowledge, okay, that's wrong. Barbed wire's still there. We're wrong, guys. Call this off. This isn't going to work. That's humility. If you allow the clock to keep ticking, which many of us know that feeling, right? It's like, you know that you're wrong. Have you ever been in a conversation with someone and your voice is, you know, curdled and, uh, and you have the angst going and you have the, uh, the tone of voice, which is sharp and cutting your thinking thoughts of how you could really throw a dagger at them. And you know it's wrong. You're in the moment, you're even alert to that. But to change it in that moment, I mean, come on, you need to write it out a little. I mean, because your dignity is at stake. Or is it? In other words, what is the wise thing to do? Wouldn't it be to stop right there and say, hey, by the way, I'm talking wrong, I'm thinking wrong, I'm acting wrong. This behavior right here stinks. I'm proud, I'm thinking about myself, I'm not approaching this as Jesus would. I'm so sorry. Of course, that can sometimes upset the other person who's riding their own wave, and they really don't like that because they want to fight, and you're like, I'm sorry. <laughs> what do you do with that? I still remember teaching this to Hudson, and I remember we were outside. He was just a little guy, you know, I, I want to say six, seven, and we were, we were talking about the measurement of humility, and we were outside, and I, I corrected him for something, sort of like, hey, buddy, I don't know if that was right. And he immediately was just like, that, you're right, that, that wasn't right, that wasn't right. And I was so impressed, because I was saying, boy, do I respond that fast. That is really good. Uh, and, but once you get that in your mind, it actually is an aid to recognize it's almost like a game, the game of humility, right? Where it's just like, clock starts, all right, I'm done, I, I, I stopped, you know, you hit a bell, dang. It's like, all right. I'm ready to humble myself. Whew, I, what was my time? What was my time? That's probably not the way we're going to be thinking about it in the moment because humility is a hard movement. It's not really a fun movement. And yet it's a critical movement for our soul. If you have moved in a direction in your life and you're running into the barbed wire, let that barbed wire be a gift a reminder, a conviction of the Holy Spirit that this is the wrong move. This is the wrong direction. And what should you do? Call off the offensive. This is wrong, guys. Don't continue to justify it. Don't continue to move forward. That leads to disaster. 
Father, I ask for each of us that you would acquaint us and instruct us in this movement of soul, this inner movement of soul to see you arrest us in the movement towards the barbed wire, that we would not have to continue in that, but that we would learn the art of turning, repenting, humbling ourselves. Lord Jesus, I pray that this inner mechanic would truly thrive in each of us and that there would be a new pattern, a new way set. Lord, forgive us for ignoring your barbed wire, for ignoring that stop to our forward movement, that halt. Lord, forgive us for justifying. And Lord, I pray that you would, by the grace of God, set new behaviors in place, behaviors that represent and reveal the kingdom of heaven in our lives. We love you. It's in the precious name we pray.